welcome and thank you for joining us to our last chance to paint webinar with artist John Dyer brought to you by Born Free. In this session we'll be learning all about and painting the world's largest species of dolphin and that is the orca. My name is Charlie and my colleague Enya is busy working in the background to help answer some of your questions and to give you shout outs and say hi as well. Um, but without any further ado, it's my absolute delight. He's already said hello to you, uh, but please can I introduce our partner of Born Free, John Dyer. Hi, thank you so much for coming to our webinar today. And I think we've got a lot of young artists, a lot of children on the call, so I'm super excited. So thank you for all the teachers for allowing this to happen. And um, yeah, it's a real privilege actually to be in this position where I could talk to so many young minds because we've got a lot to do. And hopefully today I can be part of the children deciding to be the change in our fight against climate change and extinction events so that we move forward to a better world than we've got now. And it's all super positive. Absolutely. Fantastic. Thank you, John. Uh, so as well as being a very talented artist, John is also the founder of Last Chance to Paint. And that is a project that aims to connect young people and th to nature through art and creativity. Uh, so you can find all three of John's Last Chance to Paint uh, creative schemes of work, uh, including modules uh, such as Person of the Forest, uh, Spirit of the Amazon and Precious Africa on the Last Chance to Paint and also Born Free website as well. Um, you can find out lots more about uh, that in the chat box as well uh, and John was will also you're going to share the screen quickly just to show yeah. teachers what will, they can uh, be very part quickly, of. I will very quickly uh, do that so let's do that so what we're going to do is jump in here hopefully oh that hasn't actually worked it's the first time ever so share screen yep Start broadcast, that would help if I click that. I apologise, Charlie. That's okay. Technology sometimes is a bit slow, but there we go. Lovely, yeah. we can see that now, John. Yeah, I've seen the camera. So just, just wanted to, uh, for the teachers that aren't aware of Last Chance to Paint, so this is a Last Chance to Paint webinar in partnership with Born Free or the other way around. Um, but we'd really love you to take your children through the entire website. So this is what the website looks like. Um, <clears throat> if you scroll down, there's an introductory video and... If you keep going down, we've got three expedition chapters um, that you can look at. So we've got the Amazon, Borneo and Africa, as Charlie said. Now, each of those, if I just dive into one of these, so I just dive into, uh, for example, the African one, this will give you downloadable teacher notes. And the idea is you take your children on the journey. So every day we would like uh, over, say, a period of a week or 10 days, you would show your class um, a video. Uh, so you have your teaching resources with lesson plans. It's all free and you can show them a video. And so you've got videos, blogs, and then you can ask us questions. And I will answer these live, even though I'm not on location now. And then you can submit the artwork. And th this is a really, really rich resource and, and creates an amazing uh, outcome. So you can see this is the video from day one from Kenya. And then you've got, you know, day two, so on and so forth. The idea here is that we give all the children a reason to want to be the change, a reason to want to connect. Uh, to nature. And I believe that if you follow these full plans, these full expeditions, they will find individual things they're fascinated by, whether it's animals, tribal people, whether it's the music, whether it's the art, whether it's the ecology, they'll find something that will fuel them. So as they grow up, they can be the change. So children, I really love you to do this. Um, and then what you can do once you've done the your uh, key piece of work after doing that, you can then submit your work to our world gallery. So if I just dive in here, this is our world gallery, and we will show your work next to mine um, in these different categories. So if I just jump in here, the 9 to 12, we've got 687 paintings on here. These are paintings from all around the world that have been sent in on the theme of Spirits of the Rainforest, connected to our rainforest project. And there's a very beautiful one there of the Amazon tribe in a ceremony, in a, in a traditional ceremony. So this is what we want you to do, and we'll celebrate your work online. Right, enough of that. Shall we do some painting? Um... Absolutely. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, John. OK, so John is going to start painting on his iPad. So he's using a program called Procreate. You guys who are joining today, you've got paper, you've got paints, you've got different art materials. Please feel free to start as soon as John starts his painting. 
So, John, can you tell us a little bit about what you're going to be doing first? Um, and also, talk. we can talk a little bit about what we will be painting, what hopefully we'll have at the end of today. So, I, I, I'm using a, you know, we, I'm using my little iPad, you know, that you can, so I'm very little on screen, but I've got a little iPad mini, and um, <clears throat> this allows us to pretty much broadcast my painting process to you without, it's the easiest way to do it. It's not exactly like paint, but it's very similar. First thing I'll do is I'm going to put the sky down, and I'm just using a pale blue colour here just to put some sky down, okay? Just to about sort of there. And you can do this with some blue paint and some white. You can put some dobs of white and some dobs of blue on your paper and just brush them together and you get some streaks, that's fine. Do you see I've left some streaks in my sky there? It's great, they look like clouds. If you don't get any streaks, that's also absolutely fine. Once we've done that, um, we're gonna put in some nice of the icy cold water. So orcas, um, which Charlie said are dolphins, um, they are also have the name killer whale, but they're not whales, they are dolphins. Um, they, um, you can find them in all sorts of different temperatures of water around the globe, but there's a lot in around sort of Arctic, in the north, Scotland, Canada, um, this area. So we're going to do a painting today based on that sort of uh, scene, that scenario. So this is above the water. And again, I'm just using some white and some blues, um, slightly different blue. So if you want to get that blue, uh, you could add maybe a little dot of red to it, and then you get a bit of a deeper blue. And then we're going to paint orcas under the ocean as well. So I'm going to choose another colour. So if you've got a little bit of blue and a little bit of white, you could then mix up more of a sort of turquoisey colour. And then you could put some, and then this would be the underneath the sea. And we can put that in here. And then as the, as the ocean goes down, maybe that colour becomes a bit deeper. So you could mix some other blues in. You don't have to copy the colours I'm getting here. The colours I'm choosing are kind of almost arbitrary. It's just happening because I'm choosing them quite quickly with you. Um, so don't worry about that. It's not to do with matching my exact painting or the exact colors. What we do is we're just going through a process uh, where we're gonna hear lots about orcas and we put some paint down. And through this process of painting and listening, you're gonna do high speed learning, really high speed learning. You'll remember this, I'm sure you will, because this is how I remember things, by doing things. No, that looks beautiful, John. I really love the colours. So yeah. how are you painting? So are you using quite small brushes at the moment or are you using a big brush to make these markings? That's a great question. So um, if I was using a, 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 I'm actually using an Apple pencil here, but I, I'm using quite a wide digital uh, nib on that. So if you had a flat brush, maybe like a two, two, three centimetres across, that would be ideal for your backgrounds. Um, that's a really good point, uh, Charlie, to ask. So, yeah, use a wide flat brush if you've got one. If not, just use the largest brush you've got. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and it will all go on. But this is at the very start of the painting. So the next thing I'm going to do is because we're talking about orcas and we are hoping to take you all to Canada to uh, meet a team who work with orcas in the next uh, year or two. Um, I'm going to do, base it on the sort of Canadian landscape. I'm going to put in some uh, mountains in the background. And these, this can just be painted wet on wet. So you'll have wet paint just on the top. And you can just develop a mountain range in the background just to set the scene of where these orcas might be. So here's a sort of pale uh, mountain there. And you can use a slightly smaller brush if you've got one. It's entirely up to you how you do this. And then I'm just going to choose a slightly different color it could be paler, it could be darker. Again, it won't make any difference just to put a slightly larger mountain in the background here. And this mountain is going to have some snow on it. And uh, it, the Arctic uh, as, a, as a region is, is um, suffering more from climate change than many re regions. So that's another reason why I'm highlighting this northern, um, this northern latitude, because that's where we're seeing a lot of change and a lot of um, uh, ice melt and therefore sea uh, level rise. The ice melt's not coming from the sea, by the way. The, 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 when the ice melts on Greenland, that's what will cause sea level rise. The Arctic sea ice, whether it's sea or whether it's ice, same sea level, it's just, just ice. But that does affect um, animals like polar bears who find they've got nothing to walk on, of course. So, um, so you can just develop your own mountain range. You can have some fun with this, use some smaller brushes, and then it's going to have some sort of dark patches. You can imagine if you're walking up this mountain, um, what it would be like. And there's going to be boulders and different sort of colours and different sort of shapes. And this is going to be quite a quick 
very sort of rough drawing here. You don't need to get uh, in too much detail, but we set the scene first. First, this is like our, in a way, this is our theatre set for our orcas to arrive in in a moment when we're ready. So, and I just fancy just putting some paler blue on here that picks up some of the blue from the sea, and then when you're ready, you could get some white paint. And you could just dot a bit of white paint on where you think the snow might have fallen on these mountains. And that's entirely up to you. I'm going to have snow that sort of melted those little patches of it. And I'm going to have some here catching in the ravine. You can literally transport yourself with your mind to this landscape. You can almost start to imagine what it would sound like, the beautiful openness of it, the, the sound of the waves just gently lapping at the beaches that would inevitably be at the bottom of these, or the cliffs at the bottom of these, these mountain ranges. The whole time just developing this rather tranquil, beautiful setting for these wild orcas to live in, because that's where orcas should be in their natural habitat. Like that. Lovely. Thank you, John. Um, we'll have a pause there just for a minute, because um, we've had a few people just asking if we can slow the pace down just a little bit. But Tony, you, but, um, you could, you could um, answer some questions, because I've, I've not been to see the orcas yet, so this is kind of ahead of schedule for me. But, um, you know, why... Why is a healthy ocean so important um, around the world and how does that impact orcas? Why, why is it important? Why is the ocean important? Well, the ocean, it, it impacts all of us. So essentially our planet is mostly water. It's mostly ocean. So I know that we've got a map that we're going to show with you guys in just a little in a little bit. And um, yeah, let, it shows let... how, how vast the ocean actually is. So John's going to share that on his screen. So um, yes, you mentioned the ocean. So this is this is the view that we're all used to seeing. So in the screen now, you can see Africa, there's Europe, and obviously the Asia, and then across the Atlantic, which is a vast amount of ocean. Then you've got North America, and down here you've got South America. Okay, so you can see on this normal view, the view that we tend to see of planet Earth, our beautiful blue marble of a planet. It's mainly ocean, but the view I want to show you is the one you don't often see. If we keep going round across the Atlantic Ocean, let's cross Central America and now go to the Pacific. If I keep going, look. Has our planet been mislabeled? Should it have been called water? Look, that's virtually, there's a few islands here, a few atolls, a few volcanic islands, mainly all ocean. So the ocean is arguably the most important biosphere on planet Earth, potentially. So I'm gonna get back to my painting, but I thought you should see how much ocean there is there. Yeah, and it's it's a really important habitat for loads and loads of different animals. Um, it's incredibly biodiverse. You've got coral reefs, for example, um, that are as biodiverse, if not more biodiverse than rainforests. You have huge open uh, areas of the ocean where you have big, uh, large animals living, uh, where you have whales, where you have uh, enormous uh, fish such as marlin sailfish. Um, and the ocean is actually really important to us as well. It provides us with food. It provides us also with climate regulation as well. It's really important um, for keeping our planet both warm and cool as well. Um, so it, it helps us as well as being a really important habitat uh, for countless different species, including the orca. Now, orca can be found on in every single part of the ocean. So they are found at both the poles, so in the Arctic and in the Antarctic, but then they're also found all the way down through to tropical waters as well. So they're a really incredible, adaptable animal that can survive in lots and lots of different areas. And that's because they are really intelligent. As we said, they're a member of the dolphin family, so they've got incredibly large, powerful brains. They are really social, um, but orca are amazing in that they have their own different unique cultures. So orca living in different parts of the planet will have different ways of hunting, different ways of communicating. They'll have their preferred favorite foods and they will act and speak differently as well. And as well as looking slightly different from one another. A bit like people, all, really. Yeah, exactly. They are all one species, but they are all very different. They have their own unique cultures and languages, which is absolutely amazing. So you'll have orca that live in the Antarctic, for example, which will wash seals off ice flows. And then you'll also have uh, orca, for example, that live around New Zealand that specialize in eating stingray, which is really cool. They've learned how to flip them over so they don't get stung. And then you've got orca as well, like living just off the UK, 
off the islands of Shetland and they specialize in hunting seals as well and you'll have those in Norway that specialize in hunting fish so they all have their preferred foods they all have a very varied diet they're very adaptable animals and they're just absolutely incredible really intelligent animals but Charlie do you think these schools will be ready if I started to put an orca in my painting and I've got another couple of questions for you about orcas yes right? absolutely I'm sure if we go oh. slowly that'd be great fantastic yes. we're gonna we're gonna do one two or three orcas today so we'll just, I just start with with one so I'm gonna do one jumping out of the water to start with um, fantastic so and please remember you can continue to paint as well once we have finished so even if you don't finish or are able to paint at the same speed as John there will be time afterwards as well for you to round off anything as well and sometimes I don't finish these these drawings in, in the webinar, but uh, and that's one thing when you're doing the full expeditions for the last chance to paint. It's not a painting that you you will do in an hour. It could be a painting you do over a period number of days, and it could be your very best work of art you've ever done, which is why we want to celebrate it on the World Gallery. So your art will bear witness to what we risk losing if we don't all become the change. So anyway, let's put an orca in. So I I never use black paint in my work normally, but um I am today. Um, so I'm using some black and I'm just going to put in very simply a sort of an arch here. Um, this is just sort of a line of black. This is basically just going to indicate the central axis of the orca's body. And from there, I'm going to build out how this would work. So I'm going to try and avoid zooming in, which I can do on my iPad. But so, so you can see the whole screen and um, they've got this beautiful shape. Um, oops, that's annoying. I'm just going to turn off notifications. I don't want that going on. Just bear with me. Um, so, John, we've have we have a question as well in the chat box for you. Whilst you're you're starting off your painting, um, what type of paint do you, uh, do you use, and what's the most kind of appropriate for those watching to use um, if they have it in schools today? Um, I use acrylic paints, um, which are actually really good for schools, as long as you don't do it just in your school uniform, because if you get acrylic paint on your clothes, it's going to be there forever. But acrylic paints um, or poster paints or any sort of paint is great, but acrylic paints are really good. You can put colour on top of colour, especially if you dry them down. Um, and I, I use them specifically because they dry relatively fast and I can travel with them. I'm allowed to take them um, when I go travelling. There's no rules. Whereas um oil paints uh they're not so keen on because oil paints are flammable so i use acrylic paints on canvas or i use painted boards and if you as a school if you wanted to do it if you've got if thick cardboard or bits of hardboard and if you've just got some emulsion paint or even better some gesso which is like posh emulsion paint um then you can get the, the children working on that but for today I, I suspect most of you are using poster paint or watercolor paint and Pretty much everything I do today will replicate across, apart from one thing, um, which I will map out for you now. So you're ahead of the game and orcas have very specific markings on them, white markings with their black bodies. And if you're using, uh, if you're not using a poster paint or an acrylic paint, you might want to leave an area that's paler, even though we've painted the background. Um, so you're gonna have one, you're going to have one area. So those of you using poster or acrylic, you don't need to do this. But um, otherwise, this area here that I'm drawing here is a pale area around the eye. And they also have a pale area around the front there. And then they've got the front fin, which comes off there, which will be dark. And then they have another patch, which we've already put a black line through because I wasn't considering it for those that are using um, the more transparent paints. There'll be another patch of white there. So if you outline those three patches, I'll just zoom in so you can see those areas we're going to put white in later. So it might help you just to leave the background to dry and then you can put some white on afterwards. And those of you that are using watercolor paint, um, you're just gonna end up with the blues on there unless, unless your teacher can quickly find you some gouache or some poster paint. So apologies for that, it's hard to, to, uh, to 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 sort of suit all forms, but I do this very much in the same way I would do my paintings. So I'm now in fact, I'm going to I'm going to leave those spots there so you can see them as I go. Um, normally I would just paint right over this, and I'm just going to quickly block this in because I'm aware of the time rapidly disappears. So yeah, Charlie, can you tell me? So born free is a wildlife. Um, 
a charity that really uh, fights for the for the rights really of wildlife to be in the wild, to be in its natural habitat, not caged up, not sort of poked at, but to live its life because wildlife if wildlife is doing its thing, we can do our thing. It's part of the whole fabric of the food chain of nature, of the environment, of climate. So, but is there anything specifically that Born Free does um, with orcas or to help orcas, Charlie? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we partner with an organisation in Canada. So just like in the scene that you're painting now called Orca Lab. Uh, now Orca Lab do amazing work to help uh, protect orca in the wild, but they do that in a very hands-off way. So they will monitor the orca, not by following them around on boats. What they'll do is they'll put hydrophones in the water, they'll put remote cameras in the water. And that means that they can monitor uh, the families of orca living around the lab uh, without disturbing them. Because orca, uh, like other dolphins, they use sound to help them navigate, to help them find food and to help them communicate as well. So by not following them around in boats, they're not disturbing them uh, through noise pollution um, and those orca can live um, undisturbed. Um, but one of the things that um, Orca Lab uh, worked on with Born Free a number of years ago, actually, um, was helping to uh, essentially return an orca to the wild. So um, Springer was a two year old orca calf and she lost her mother when she was a baby. Uh, she was too small to survive on her own, but she had lost her pod. And uh, she was found swimming alone near Seattle in the USA. Now, no. yeah, really sad. So she was she was lost, disorientated, um, and she was found. And the entertainment industry wanted her to go into captivity. So, for example, in a tank um, in a dolphinarium. Um, but our partners at Orca Lab, because they listen to Orca using those hydrophones, they were actually able to identify Springer through her unique calls. Because like I said earlier, Orca have their own unique calls and unique languages. So by listening to the call of an Orca, you can essentially work out which, which family, which pod that they've come from. So we were able to locate her family, know exactly where she was from. And we, we helped Orca Lab to transport her up to a uh, sea pen near Vancouver in Canada, which is where her pod were living in the wild. And she spent a few a few days in the in the sea pen, and she was calling, and her pod heard her calls and came to find her. And we that opened the gate. Yeah, yeah, it's incredible, well, isn't sorry it? Sorry to interrupt, but that is that is incredible. Yeah. That really links into what you were saying. They have different languages. They, they eat different things. They act in different ways. They, they, they are that they're so similar to to people to indigenous they tribes. Really are. And the fact that they can recognise each other, I think we, I think as a species, we have continually underestimated the uh, intelligence and uh, and the abilities and the empathy that animals have for each other. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so, yeah, so her, her pod came to find her and we were able to open the gate to her sea pen and she swam off with her pod and the oh. really exciting thing that was, that was around 20 years ago now. And Springer is still out in the wild swimming free. She has two calves of her own named Spirit and Storm. Uh, and those those calves wouldn't wouldn't exist in the wild today if it weren't for the help of Orca Lab and also Born Free uh, being able to relocate her so she could be back with her family. That's it's amazing. A, a lovely success story of a, an animal going back to the wild. It's an amazing, amazing story. And um we can't play the sounds of orcas today, but look them up, you know, visit Orca Lab if, if you look that up online. Um, some of the sounds they make are incredible. And I, when we go to, hopefully when we go to do, uh, um, to Orca Lab to run a full project on this, I think that sound and music could be a big part of this for, for you guys in the schools uh, as well, as for my team who might travel. Um, it's, yeah, I think, there's something about dolphins and whales that is quite amazing. Um, in fact, and also, you know, the primates and many animals, you know, many animals. I mean, even down as far as an ant, you know, an ant you would think is a pretty much um, a non-intelligent sort of species, but it can do incredible things. But that ant, when it works with all the other ants, and you add them all up together, they can literally, they, they can do things as if they're part of a bigger form. 
So life should not be underestimated in, in any way. Now, can I just talk about what we're doing with this orchid here? So I, you can see I put the white patches on. I've used some gray paint uh, along the back of my orca, which is just some black with a little bit of white. You can just put a stripe of gray where the light's catching it. Then on there, they're really shiny and they're really wet. So you, if you get a very thin brush and some white paint, you can actually put some bright white little reflections. Just imagine how the reflections would be going on your orca because he or she is really, really wet as they're coming out of the ocean, either chasing prey or just enjoying being alive. I mean, dolphins can't breathe underwater. They're mammals uh, like you and I. So they have to breathe air from the surface. So they do come up to the surface and they do explore it. And uh, yeah, you can put some shine on. And if you sort of put the shine on, this could be just makes them look really wet and that beautiful skin that they have. And uh, yeah, that, it's just such a fun thing to do. And it also picks up some of that snow in the background. And then once you've got that far, you can then have a look at where this water might be coming out if this orca has jumped out. And then you can have some fun with some splashes. I'm just getting a slightly bigger paint and making sure I've got pure white. And then you can actually put some splashes up here where this orca's emerging from the ocean. And do you see how my paint is also going quite blue here? Um, that's because it's picking up the colour as yours would. I try and replicate what you, you get, but if you get a finer brush and go back with some more paint, you can then put some brighter patches of white on top. And by all means, um, just to show you my iPad here, I know it's very small in the corner of your whiteboards, but sometimes I will turn my iPad slightly to one side uh, like this so that I can angle, because it's easier for me to paint like that than it is for me to paint upwards. So by all means, rotate your paper slightly if, if the way your hand is working um, will work better like that. I do that all the time when I'm doing my canvases. So, um, and talking of canvases, Charlie, can I just talk briefly about the, the painting here to my left while we're talking about water? Yeah, sure. So is that the painting, this has nothing to do with orcas, but this painting is all to do with water. So if you follow our first expeditions, um, Spirit of the Rainforest with the Yawanawa tribe. This is a painting from an Amazon Indian called Nishiwaka Yawanawa. And this is the back of a, of a lady. This is her hair. And this is all water flowing down her hair. So basically, the Amazon tribe, they know how important water is to the rainforest, to their well-being, to the whole cycle of life, and the spirit that is in control. And in fact, for them, creates all of the water. And it's not a belief system, they, they know this, we might have to believe this because we're not Amazon Indians, all comes through Uxiev's hair, or Ushiva, as they pronounce it. Um, so she's depicted here with her hair, she's got a crown made of bird feathers to show that she's a, a spirit, and she's got these beautiful wings left and, left and right, which are like spiritual butterfly wings. And then there's a vine in the background, again, with spiritual butterflies which um, indicates the tribal ceremonies they use to talk to Ushiva, and they find out from her um, what's happening with the rainforest, when there's going to be a drought, when there's going to be a flood, what, what foods are good for the moment, so on and so forth. So water is important to us all, whether you're an orca or whether you are you or whether you're an Amazon Indian. We all need water. We need to look after it. OK, how, how do you think how we all do any? Are there any comments in the chat box to say this is all too fast or too slow? How are we? Can I move on to more orcas or? I think if we keep it a little bit slow for now, uh, we've got okay. one question in the chat box for you as well, John. Uh, okay. So did you have any training in order to become such a skilled artist? That's well, very kind of you to use those words. Um, yes, <clears throat> I was trained from birth by my father, who's an artist. So I grew up in a house surrounded by, well, pretty much like this, surrounded by paintings. And um, I, I, I studied art at school. I loved it at primary school, absolutely loved it. Whenever we were doing a subject, I would do a painting to do with it. Moved on to secondary school, did my, uh, what, what would now be GCSE art, did my A-level art, and then decided I wanted to go to art school where I knew I wanted to be a designer or a photographer or wanted to make films or I wanted to paint or do sculptures. I wasn't quite sure, but I knew I wanted to be creative. And creativity is important for you all because you all need to 
be really creative as we go through the next few years and as you grow because a it's fun b it's really good for your for your well-being it's really relaxing it's really exhilarating and also it's going to help you problem solve and there's lots of really exciting problems that need to be solved uh, for your generation and you're going to do it and you're going to love doing it and be well um, well paid for doing it too um, and I did all of that and then I chose to do a degree in London and in fact I chose not to paint because I was very much into my painting personally and I was also into photography so I did a course in graphic design which is how you design logos for companies or magazine pages or websites. Um, I did that but the whole time I did that with the idea that it would help me to actually get my photography or my art out to an audience. And um, yeah, so I have had training, but with the art, I've tried to keep the art mine. I've tried not to have too much influence with my actual painting. I've decided to succeed and fail on my own terms. So as a young artist, I taught for a decade at what is now Falmouth University, but used to be the art school. So that paid the bills. So my paintings didn't have to, and that's how I did it. But having that whole set of skills from, you know, graphics design you know to the to the logo here I can do the whole thing from the last chance to paint website I do it all and I love doing it all and it's proved to be a really good combination for me amazing thanks John um we've had a few more questions come through for you so um we have who inspired you to do art I think you've covered that a little bit already um yeah, your family and things. Fun, yeah. um and also what is your favorite painting if you have one of mine or somebody else's of yours i think <laughs> oh i don't know um it's i do love the work i do with last chance to paint and i've always loved the work i do on location so i mean there's a painting over here of mine which i love this is an amazon indian uh based on the amazon indian experience i had it's my painting um you can't see it very well but um it's of two snakes the ground snake and the sky snake and it's how important those animals are to the tribe. So basically, whenever I travel and whenever I paint, those whatever the latest paintings are, are my favourite latest paintings. And I think as an artist, I think if you did a painting, let's say today we all nail orcas perfectly and we go, that's my favourite painting. And in six months time, that's still my favourite painting. And in six years time, that's still my favourite painting. I think there's a problem because I think you will always want to be making your next painting your favourite painting or whatever it is, your favorite bit of maths, your maths is next piece of maths, or your favorite piece of, um, I don't know, biology or looking at insects is the next thing you're going to explore. That's what keeps scientists and mathematicians and creatives and anybody on their journey. That's what keeps Orca Lab going. They want to hear the next song or the next series of clicks or whistles from the Orca. They want to discover the next thing they haven't realized. So yeah, they'll have their favorite, but then they're gonna have their next favorite. That's what we explore. I'm going to do some seaweed. Do I have permission for seaweed? I think go for it, John. That's fantastic. Yeah, let's get, let's Thank get some you. Stuff here. So basically, you know, the oceans that we showed you on basically planet Earth is basically planet water. And um, if it's huge. It's got mountain ranges which would be higher than the Himalayas. It's got the deepest crevasses. It's got the most amazing plant life down there. And we need to be super, super careful of this environment because it is locking up so much carbon in all these beautiful plants so you get wonderful kelp uh, forests growing uh, all sorts of seaweeds but uh, basically if you imagine if you imagine it's like a it's not a rainforest it's not the right example but it's as important or more important than the rainforests and the seaweed and the, and the plants in the oceans are absolutely pivotal so i'm putting in you can just you can use some greens you could use some browns or some oranges whichever colors you you like just to put in some seaweeds underneath here. And then once you've got some of those in, we're going to do another orca or maybe another two. Maybe one is going to be enough for today, but we'll, we'll have a look. And then you'll see why I'm putting these on now, because we want to put the orca on top of this seaweed, okay? Um, so if you just put this on and you see, I'm using, a zoom in here, I'm using different sort of brush strokes. So you can twist your brush and you can make it narrower and you can make it wider depending on the shape of your brush. And you can use different colors as if there's some light filtering through the water and catching on the seaweed. So you can imagine there'd be slightly brighter colors where the sun was catching it. And I just put some up on here too. 
So you can just do this in any way you like. It's very organic, just like the ocean would be. This would be all moving as the currents went by and as the orcas swam by. So just pop some seaweed in there and then we'll then we'll put another orca on with that. Okay. Amazing. Thanks, John. I'm just going to jump in and actually talk about the seaweed for a minute. So kelp is actually really important. Um, it's an amazing uh, environment and habitat for lots of different animals as well but also it helps lock in carbon into the ocean so kelp forests in the ocean can store as much carbon as rainforests they're really incredibly important habitat to look after now there are kelp forests around where orcas can be found so if, for example off the coast of california you know a huge kelp forest really tall kelp um, that grows meters and meters tall right from the seafloor all the way to the surface and there are actually um, nursery grounds for the gray whales uh, off the east coast of California and the gray whales will use kelp as cover because orca have two names so they're known sometimes as killer whales and this name actually came from the fact they came from fishermen who used to observe them hunting other whales so orca or dolphin but they they hunt larger species of whale such as gray whales they have even been known to hunt the largest whale species on the planet so the blue whale and that's where they get their name so fishermen oh. used to see them killing and eating whales they called them whale killers and then that has changed to killer whales um, over time so their official name is orca but that's why they're sometimes called killer whales but the grey whales will sometimes use that kelp as cover they will swim as close as they can to that kelp to help kind of protect them from the orca so it's a bit like cover and it will help them sneak around past the orca um, as well so kelp is an incredibly important uh, habitat for lots of different animals including whales and orca too it is and that the, the capturing carbon carbon um, for the children listening carbon dioxide is what um predominantly we breathe in about 20 percent oxygen out of the sort of 100 percent of the air there's about 70 percent nitrogen in there too but when we breathe out there's a lot more carbon dioxide uh, there and that's fine that's a natural process but we are releasing a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere through many things at the moment and uh, planet earth can only absorb so much and then things start to warm up. So it's uh, known as a greenhouse gas, um, which is causing climate change. So what we need to do is try as a population is try and reduce the amount of um, carbon dioxide. Now the oceans are an amazing um, carbon sink. Um, things like kelp forests, and there's also plankton that will grow, but also the water itself will soak up carbon dioxide. And you, you think, great, that's fine. And it is fine to a point, but we are approaching the point now where um, if you, it, this is basic um, science that you'll cover probably later on in, in school, but if you add carbon dioxide to water, um, it creates an acid, carbonic acid. So and that's not great if you're an orca to be swimming around in carbonic acid. So at some point, not only does the water become so acidified that it becomes difficult uh, for it to support life, um, but even if the orcas, uh, the dolphins, the whales um, uh, can survive in that sort of ocean, the heat is going up the whole time as well. Um, and what happens is the food column. So things, um, so all the smaller creatures that make the, that will feed the fish and the fish will feed the, the orca, that starts to collapse. So we must be really mindful um, that we all, all of us, and I'm talking to you children as well here, and to myself and to Charlie, who knows all about this, we all have to do our best to, to be the change in our fight against climate change so that we don't all um, struggle with this in the future. And we are we are currently on a trajectory, we're currently heading to a slightly difficult place, but we um, there's also a very exciting future for all of us if we all become the change and start to use new technology. So things like when when people get an opportunity to swap a, a diesel car for an electric car in the future, that will be great. Um, when we get a chance to swap our heating um, so it's running mainly on electric and that electric is has been produced from renewable sources like wind or solar or geothermal, that will be great. 
So there's lots of things that we can that we can do. But while we're waiting to buy electric cars, or in fact, not have a car at all, just take public transport, there are a few other things that we can do to limit our own carbon dioxide output. And um, one of the main things that you can do is just have a look at um, your um, food and just to reduce um, certain elements of, of your food. So if you are, um, uh, for example, um, there are different staple foods in different parts of the world. So if you're in Asia, rice would be your staple food. If you're in the UK or America, wheat would be your staple food. That's great. But if everybody in Asia started to eat wheat and everybody in the UK and America predominantly had rice, then there's a lot of shipping of food around. It doesn't really need to go on. So eat as local as you can, local ingredients. Not everything, but broadly, uh, if you can. Also eat um, as much of a plant-based diet as you can. Uh, at the moment, about 18% of our CO2 emissions, which is by no means all of them, but it is quite a big number. It's getting on to 20%, but 18% is what we're told is coming through the production of uh, meat, which is fine. Um, and uh, so just try and choose, you know, if you've got a meat-free Monday at school, that's great. You know, really learn from that. And wherever you can, just reduce one's meat intake and that also applies to fish as well. Um, and meat and fish can be very healthy options for you uh, in your diet, um, but just not every meal every day. Just reduce it a bit and uh, that will really help. And also plastic in the ocean is a big issue. And sadly, around about 70%, 70, that's a big number um, of the plastic in the ocean is coming from the fishing industry, lost nets and floats and buoys and fishing tackle and stuff. So. And orcas and other animals do get caught in that and it breaks down and causes pollution. So we sometimes people you might hear people will say, oh, there are there are so many people on planet Earth. This is causing the problem. Well, I'm not saying that we haven't caused a problem. We have. But it's I don't think that we should say it's down to numbers of people. I just think we need to alter our behavior. And if we all do that, there are about two billion children on planet Earth. If we all do that, if all the children did that and if all the adults did that, I certainly did that 35 years ago. I moved to a broadly plant based diet. Um, then you can make quite a big impact while we're waiting for other technologies to to catch up. Right. Enough of that. I've sketched out another couple of orcas and I'm going to quickly put the white patches on um, so that you can see what I'm doing here. And then we'll do the shine and everything as well. So I'm just going to put slight gray patch here where this orca is catching the light as I did before. Lovely and while you're doing that John we've had some orca questions come in uh, oh. so how big can orcas grow so orca they're the biggest member of the dolphin family like we said and they can get really big so an adult male they can grow up to 10 meters long so those meter sticks in your classrooms Imagine 10 of those all lined up or go and do it on the playground after this. See how long a male orca is. They are really big animals and they can weigh a colossal 10,000 kilos. So really, really heavy animals as well. Huge. Um, <laughs> really huge. So females tend to be a bit smaller than males, um, but they're still, still very large animals. Um, a male orca's dorsal fin. So you'll see John has painted on these dorsal fins. Uh, for male orca, they can be really tall as well. So they can be 1.8 meters tall and a okay. female's can be around 80 centimeters tall. So again, look at your meter sticks. That's how big that amazing dorsal fin, uh, how high it can get. And um, as we've talked about Springer earlier, so she was potentially going to go and live in captivity um, if she'd been taken by the uh, entertainment industry and if she hadn't had the opportunity to be reunited with her wild family. Now, Orca don't cope well in captivity, just like other dolphins and uh, other marine mammals. Um, it's very noisy in uh, tanks because uh, there's filtration systems going on. And again, because they're animals that navigate using sound, they communicate using sound, um, it can be very stressful. Um, obviously, orcas travel huge distances every day. They can travel up to 100 miles a day to find food and to socialize. And if they're living in a small tank, they don't get to travel those huge distances. And in order to, to exercise, essentially, that they'll either 
get bored and they'll just float in their tanks or they swim in circles over and over again just so that they're, they're traveling and they're swimming and if you see orca in captivity a lot of the time uh, their fins will be flopped over and that's just because they're swimming in circles constantly so those giant fins they're not supported properly by the water and they'll flop over um so <laughs> that's, it is, that's literally terrible isn't it i mean as we said, these animals are they're highly intelligent, highly sociable, highly emotional creatures. So to have them in captivity is that's awful. So Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. and again, they have a really varied diet. So we, we've spoken about what they eat. So they eat fish in some parts of the world. They eat uh, stingray. They eat uh, sea lions, seals and also other whales as well. And if they're kept in captivity, they often only get fed. Uh, frozen fish so they don't get uh, that huge variety as well so it's it's not the best place for them not the right place for them so it's obviously much better for these animals to be in the wild um, and that's what we work to try and make sure happens that these animals can stay in the wild Charlie, so orca, orcas are an apex predator then is, is, absolutely is... yeah they are top of the food chain so in fact orca have also been known to hunt and eat the other top predator in the ocean that we all know, the great white shark, and they will um, attack them for their liver because their liver is really fatty and full of lots of nutrients and orca absolutely love it. So there have been known cases, uh, recorded cases of orca attacking and eating great white sharks. So they are the top of the food chain. Wow, right. I'm just going to stop you there for a second. So just while I just talk about this, so we've now got three orcas. I'm not expecting you all to have three orcas in, but I'm aware we've only got 10 minutes left with you guys. So just going to go back to the seaweed here. So you can see my two orcas um, are sort of in front of the seaweed. The small one at the back probably shouldn't be in front of the seaweed. So I'm just going to fix that by getting some of the colour that would be on your palette. And I'm just going to just put this seaweed up over the top of this orca here, okay, because my seaweed's rather large here, like that. It will just place that one at the background. Do you see how magic that is immediately? And then I'm going to take another seaweedy colour. So I'm going to go for a greeny, sort of, or maybe a more of a browny, greeny colour, for a kelpy colour. And then I'm going to put some seaweed in in the front here, which will now go over the top of this orca. I'm going to get a slightly wider brush, and it will just start to set the scene. Of, of how they're using the, the kelp for cover in, in my painting here. And you can see why I put some seaweed on first and some, some afterwards. So you can have some fun. Don't put too much on, just a couple of strands, two or three strands, just to get your um, orca into the painting, all right? Do you see how quickly that worked? It sort of really set the scene. And then what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna work on reflections just with some white paint and a very fine brush just to sort of put, and I'm just working on the, the surface of the water here, and then I'm going to put some reflections where there might be, leaving sort of trails of bubbles um, in and around the, the seaweed, or just disturbing the water, just to make this magical. And again, up on the surface, there would be lots of reflections up here, and you can get a little paintbrush and put lots of lovely dots of white paint. You probably can't see pretty much what I'm doing, I'm putting little dots up on the surface. I'm just gonna work across the whole surface of my painting, just making sure it's all sparkly and looks like the ocean, like that. And this will start to really make the painting work. And occasionally I might even put an extra piece of shine on my lovely, wet, beautifully smooth orcas. So that's what I'm doing there. So um, Charlie, it strikes me if the orcas can be so large, this probably isn't related to, um, to age, is it? But how long can an orca live for? I know that humans tend to live to around 80, 83, and then some much longer, but how long does an orca live from? Live for? <laughs> so orcas can live a really long time. So they can live uh, between 80 and 90 years in the wild, and females tend to live longer than males. And it's thought there was one matriarch of a pod, so one older female who had reached 100 years old. So they are really long lived mammals. So they tend to live a lot longer in the wild as well compared to when they're living in captivity um, where their lifespans tend to be much shorter. But they are amazing animals and uh, they um, can have multiple calves in their lifetime as well. So a female uh, tends to spend a lot more energy looking after male calves than they do female calves. So if she has a male calf, 
they tend to have fewer calves because the males take up so much of their time and tend to ask for food even when they're fully grown. So while females will go off uh, and hunt for themselves, males will still beg for food uh, well into their kind of 30s, 40s. <laughs> It sounds so much like human society. It's just, it's just incredible. It's, yeah, it's amazing. So, um, and so I've drawn, I've basically drawn or painted a family here. So what would that be called in, in orca language? Is it a family of orcas? What is that going to be called? Uh, so you get, there are lots of different terms. So there's some really complicated ones. So you get things called matrilines. Uh, oh. So those are uh, no run by... <laughs> <laughs> so those are run by uh those are run by uh the female matriarch um right. you can also get pods as well which are slightly larger and you can get ecotypes so an ecotype for example is like we talked about earlier those uh those different uh cultures essentially so those orca from maybe one area that speak similar languages that uh, share similar hunting techniques um so there's lots of different stages um different types of group of orca that like I said they're very complex animals uh some will live in kind of small pods uh, so Springer for example again she tends to live on her own with her two calves but will interact with other pods in her local area as well um so depending on wh who the orca is how they feel about other orca they can live in really large pods or they can live in very small family pods as well so Charlie, is there, are there other things? We spoke about a more plant-based diet and reducing the CO2 because of the um, acidification of the ocean and, and, and the whole kind of like how that impacts, impacts the climate. But uh, is there anything else the children can do at their schools or um, in their families that just has a really positive impact on, on what's happening with our planet that will make a difference? Absolutely. Yeah, so there's lots of things that you can just do in your everyday life. So as John spoke about earlier, just treading gently um, and just uh, having less essentially. So it's um, really easy things that you can do such as turning off lights, that's really important. So the, the less electricity we use, um, the fewer carbon emissions uh, that we are generating because a lot of our um, electricity is still generated by burning off fossil fuels. Whilst that is hope that is changing and we are getting more and more renewables, uh, we are still creating a lot of carbon through things like energy. So just being really mindful and being really thoughtful. Do I need to, to keep that light on? Uh, maybe when you finish charging your devices at home, so your iPads and things like that, remember to turn them off at the wall when you've finished. And that helps save energy, save electricity. And also it's really good for helping save money as well. So it's, it's a win-win really. Um, saving water as well, as John said earlier, talking about the water cycle it's really important that we conserve water not just for ourselves but also for wildlife as well um the more we use the the less there is to go around and actually also only that, a very small that links sorry, sorry, to interrupt, it, that also, sorry to interrupt that also links into what charlie's just told you about energy usage every time you turn the tap it, it's been um purified it's been pumped it's it does so uh, so don't go without water guys okay do not go without water but don't waste it because there's a there's a big sort of like energy system behind water getting it to you fresh and then dealing with it once it's grey water or wastewater as well sorry to interrupt there Charlie but I suddenly no, absolutely that, that LinkedIn a very as well. good point no a good point absolutely if you're thirsty go have a drink please make sure you have water it's yeah. really important but maybe think about instead of having a half an hour shower can I reduce that bit, that little bit? Every bit you save uh, will be will um, be there for for other wildlife or other people as well. So that's one little thing you can do. Yeah, as and there's something else, something that I do with my family. So we have the plant based diet broadly, not entirely, um, but we have we're lucky that we have a front garden, a little front garden, and a little back garden, and we make sure that's got it's just full of plants, and lots of those plants um, just grow naturally, so we don't have to use any sort of weed killers we don't have to use any sort of like pest control or slug pellets because we let the plants grow that want to grow and that means we've got lovely habitats as well for wildlife so we've got a front path and yes we sweep the leaves up because it would be dangerous for us and our postman and all the rest of it but where we can leave um nature to be nature we do and then we find that we have we have squirrels and rodents and we have hedgehogs and we have all sorts of birds and that's really good. And that's that's there. Where you see a pile of leaves, see a bed for a hedgehog. You know, so if you can leave nature be 
And if, um, whereas our neighbours have done the exact opposite, they built on it and concreted it, and then they put plastic decking everywhere. They've erased nature. But if individually we can all try and bring as much nature back, that will make a huge difference. At your schools, if you've got fencing, that's great, keeps you safe. But if there is a, an opportunity to plant wildflowers or, or bushes, that's great. If there's a place to put a tree, particularly a British native tree, if you're in the UK, maybe an American native in, in, in the USA, so on and so forth, put a tree in. That's one of our best ways of trapping carbon dioxide. Plant a tree. Amazing invention. Absolutely. And yeah, so if you've got a little bit of space in your school playground, or even if you've only got space for a window box at home, even those little areas really help protect wildlife and give them a home as well. So there's loads of little things like that you can do. Yeah. Um, I'm going to answer some very quick questions before we go, because we've only got a couple of minutes. Um, so what noise do orcas make? So orcas make uh, clicks and whistles, um, but we definitely recommend that you go and look up some sounds. So if you go on Orca Lab's website, uh, they have live cameras where you can watch uh, the orca actually underwater, which is amazing, or from the surface. So we definitely recommend that you go and watch that. Um, absolutely. Lovely. Uh, John, one word answer. What is your favourite animal you have ever painted? Orangutan. Amazing. <laughs> Brilliant. And actually, you can uh, paint orangutan as well. So uh, if you look up the Last Chance to Paint website that we shared with you earlier, uh, the person of the forest, uh, you can paint along with John and paint some orangutans. So that's amazing. Meet them, really? learn their names, connect to them, understand about the rainforest, what's happening. And again, um, yeah, you can you can make a difference. So watch that. I think you'll love it. I think, yeah, you're going to love it. Absolutely. Brilliant. Fantastic. So we've got the last couple of minutes. So just before we go, John, uh, yeah. can you just tell us a little bit about your painting? Uh, yes. So I painted a pod. I can't remember the fancy word you used. A pod of um, of orcas, uh, basically based up towards Canada, where Orca Lab is. I've yeah. used several techniques. So I put the background down first. I've blended my colours on the paper or on my iPad to make it easy. I set the scene with the mountains and some snow. I put the line of the water where we go from the top of the water and underneath. I put some seaweed on and then I use that to overlap the orcas that I overlaid on it and then put seaweed over them to set layers within my painting. And I'm using white paint with a tiny brush just to put the shine on and the reflections on the water. And by doing this, I'm connecting to Orca. I'll always remember do, doing this. And when I hear about wildlife that, you know, needs a bit of help from us so that we can pull back, give it some space, um, I'm, I'm gonna have a reason to, I'm connected. And that gives me a reason to be the change. And we all need to be the change. You, me, your teachers, your parents, your guardians, your family, and the children to come, all need to be the change. We can't blame everybody else. We can actually do something ourselves. Absolutely. So, yeah, and we can all make tiny changes and we can all make a positive change. So, yeah, thank you so much, John. I love your painting. I think it's absolutely beautiful. I'm sure that those of you watching have also created some absolutely amazing artwork and we would absolutely love to see it. So, would, yes. watching, yeah, please do. If you photograph them, if you're sharing them on your school social media, please do remember to tag the Born Free Foundation and also John Dyer and Last Chance to Paint. Uh, we'd love to see what you've been up to. We're sure they look absolutely incredible. If um, you, um, the teachers, if you if you can photograph them and send them into our World Gallery, their instructions go to lastchancetopaint.com. Click the World Gallery at the top on the on the uh, main menu. Um, submit the art. We'd love to see your paintings. We can put them on the gallery. We'll make a, an orca section for these. But also when you do the other expeditions, please send in the children's art. It's really important. And I'm hoping that in the next couple of years, we'll have a big exhibition of the art that's sent in. There's lots of lots of plans going on, but it's really important. So the children Amazing. will be painting what we stand to lose and it will help us all to remember. Oh, and put, put, take your kids, take your paintings home, Put them on the fridge when they're dry, put them on the fridge, leave them there for the next 20 years and let them remind you of how precious our natural world is, because if the natural world is healthy. We can be healthy. Absolutely. No, thank you, John. 
And thank you so much uh, to everyone else for joining us today. Um, like we said, please share your work. Please tag us. Please send them in as well. We'd love to see what you've been up to. Um, Born Free also has a range of free teaching resources as well um, as a free educational magazine. Um, so if you're interested in that, please contact us. Please go to our website. Um, we also run free outreach workshops as well around the rainforest, animals in captivity and animals under threat. So if you're interested in any of these, please do send us an email, education at bornfree.org.uk. And thank you so much for joining us. We're having lots of lovely comments, John, coming in saying thank you. We love this. We love painting. We love the opportunity. Thank you. So we think everyone has enjoyed it. So oh, thank that's you great. so much. <laughs> well, we, do, we try and do three webinars every year. So we'll have one in the spring and one in the summer for you. So look at lastchancetopaint.com. Again, webinars in the top menu, that'll give you the webinars. Um, keep an eye on those dates and then you'll be able to sign up in due course. Please sign up so that we can email you, that this is to the teachers, please sign up so we can email you to keep you informed. And we will be planning a new full expedition next year, which I'm hoping will either be to the Orcas or maybe to Australia or maybe somewhere else, still planning it, but we're gonna take you uh, on a full expedition. So please do that too. So keep in touch with us. And if we can do it better, email me john at lastchancetopaint.com and we will improve amazing thanks john um i'm just going to say thank you to the schools at the end as well but thank you so much for joining us we hope you have had a lovely time we can't wait to see your paintings and have a lovely day thanks bye